distribution rate is 9. Can the American people change Washington, D.C.? In Washington today, you, could, you cannot fix Washington. Washington was created in deception starting in 1868. The 41st Congress changed Washington to a corporate-style government and gave it a, an area of jurisdiction of 100 square miles, which is known as Washington, D.C. or the District of Columbia today. In 1974, uh, some of the land was taken back from Washington, and today Washington is 68 square miles. Anyone who claims to be a citizen of the United States, under legal definition of the United States, is, oh, is pledging their allegiance to Washington, D.C. or the District of Columbia. They do not, they are not Americans. You can be a U.S. citizen or you can be an American, but you can't be both. It's impossible. Anyone who claims to be a citizen of the United States, under legal definition of the United States, is, oh, is pledging their allegiance to Washington, D.C. or the District of Columbia. They do not, they are not Americans. You can be a U.S. citizen or you can be an American, but you can't be both. It's impossible. The total jurisdictional authority and territory of the corporation in Washington is the District of Columbia, period. It has never been legislated any differently than that. So why is the District of Columbia ruling over the states in America? Well, they're doing it, go back to the implied consent that we talked about earlier. They are using implied consent of the people because we are not saying no. You can throw everybody out of Washington. You can, you can vote every single one out. You can change the president, change the entire Congress, and you cannot change Washington. It was created in deception. It has operated in deception since 1868. And nothing you do to change it, uh, there's nothing you can do to change it. You can't change Washington. Washington is what it is. A leopard cannot change its spots. They cannot turn over a new leaf because the laws are designed for them to deceive, lie, and cheat the American people. And we can document that. All right. How did the American people lose the original constitutional republic? Well, first of all, the, everybody thought we still had the same system of government that we always had because they did the change so slowly and gradually, and they never told the public. They never, they never told us what was going on. The government was changed without the consent of the people, and it's very clear in the Declaration of Independence that they governed by the consent. Well, in, under our system of law, for them to alter or abolish or change anything in the Constitution, they have to go to the people. They, Congress can't do that. And in 1868, when this change really started, uh, it went from 1868 through 1882 where the primary changes were done, Congress never once asked the people what they wanted. And they had no authority to move forward. We get our authority from the Declaration, the Holy Bible, and the Constitution to move forward. And that's what we have embraced. Now, about 30 years ago, a group of people, you call them patriots or sovereigns, whatever the term was at the time, began to study the law. Because we'd been dumbed down. We didn't know what was going on. We had no idea what had been done to the American people. 
But we get, began to study and read the law. And all of a sudden, things started showing up. It's all in there. It's all recorded, but it's hidden. But when we started doing thousands, and many people across the country started doing studies, all of a sudden, God gave the people an interest in the law. And it was part of a, a divine movement across this nation to wake up the people of America. All of this was orchestrated by God, folks. It was not orchestrated by us. God woke the people up, and they began to study, and they began to learn that the keys to their freedom was in the law already, and we just, we just uncovered those keys, and we brought them out, and we began to use them. And we discovered that they never got our consent to do away with our republic. So everything that has been done since 1872 at the very latest, probably earlier than that, has been done without the consent of the people and therefore is unlawful. But that doesn't make it illegal. It is legal because we have given our implied consent. And implied consent works like this. If you're holding a cup of coffee and drinking a cup of coffee and I walk up to you and I take that cup of coffee away from you and you don't say no or you don't protest, whose coffee is it? It's my coffee now. But if I try to take it away from you and you don't let me have it, you, you get to keep the coffee, right? That's the way implied consent works. The people did not say no. And so the government in their legal system decided that that is okay because they didn't protest. They didn't say no. Well, the people are standing up now by the thousands across America and joining with this republic and saying no. And now... The legal system is in very much jeopardy because they cannot continue to operate without the consent of the people. And the people are not granting them that consent anymore. So they have no authority and we have all the authority. Because this republic was sanctioned by Almighty God. It is recorded in history and it has never been repealed. I don't have any glass, so I might as well hang up and say peace. I just want to... <laughs>
Ignition rate is nine. Count 347 or plus 7. Adrenal off 0.74. We are receiving an extreme respiratory count from a magnum manipulator in operating cell 94107. Erratic visual behavior. Transfer control information. Current brainwave confirmation on 1138. Adrenal off 0.74. Analyze severe. <laughs> The truth becomes clearer when we simply look at our current banking system. According to a report entitled, The Federal Reserve Directors, a study of corporate banking influence conducted by the Committee on Banking, Currency and Housing, House of Representatives, in August 1976, it was concluded that all major financial banking cartels of the United States are all subsidiaries of the London Bank of England. In other words, the Neiman Rothschild Bank owns every major bank in the United States. This list includes Lehman Brothers and Morgan Stanley, recently dissolved from the created economic crisis, National City Bank, Chase Manhattan, and many others. Every time a taxpayer pays a tax, they are transferring their labor to the Queen of England and her heirs. Who are her heirs, you may be asking? all of your presidents and high office officials who are related to the aristocracy by blood. These officials are more commonly known as esquires. An esquire is defined as a man belonging to the higher order of English gentry, ranking immediately below a knight. To represent the crown, esquires or attorneys were used to handle the legal process of infiltrating the Americas. These esquires maintain positions of power, thus continuing control through British Admiralty law. Most of us have heard of Benjamin Franklin and John Adams and their early contributions to the United States, but what you may not have heard is that Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay were all esquires to the Crown. They negotiated the Paris Peace Treaty of 1783 on behalf of the United States. It becomes clearer now why the treaty seems to align in favor of the British even though they supposedly lost the war. The Paris Peace Treaty did not give America title to land. The King's possessions in America were protected and governed by corporate charters. Benjamin Franklin visited England and France many times during the Revolutionary War. Again, the British just moved from overt control of the 13 colonies to covert control. After the Civil War, the United States was financially weakened. Low on resources and still struggling to put the country back together, America needed money. The international bankers were right there to lend us all that we needed. In 1871, Congress cut a deal with the Rothschild bankers to incur a debt, which would allow the establishment of a new government controlled by foreign money interest. Under the Legislative Act of February 21, 1871, the United States government incorporated as a commercial enterprise to do business for profit. What that means is that the United States of America changed from a country into a corporation. What you must understand is that this changed the entire process of how our government works and its overall objective as an enterprise. This Legislative Act of 1871 designated the District of Columbia under a separate form of government with separate jurisdiction from the rest of the Union States with the United States of America. Now incorporated as a commercial enterprise, the country could borrow huge sums of money from the international bankers. The debt would eventually get so high that by 1933 
just 62 years later, the United States would have to file for Chapter 11. Because of the Legislative Act of February 21, 1871, Washington, D.C. is not a state, but a jurisdiction called the District of Columbia. The evidence for this fact can be found in the 41st Congress, Session 3, Chapter 62, 1871, when they state, An act to provide a government for the District of Columbia, be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States in Congress assembled, that all that part of the territory of the United States included within the limits of the District of Columbia be, and the same is hereby created into a government by the name of the District of Columbia, by which name is hereby constituted a body corporate for municipal purposes and may be contract and be contracted with, sue and be sued. In short, the 50 states are separate from the jurisdictional lands of the District of Columbia. This district is a corporation called the United States of America. Contrary to what you were taught in school, the United States is not a country. It is a corporation like IBM, General Motors, or Microsoft. This corporation has legal jurisdiction to do business and create franchises. Consider the other 50 states as franchises for the parent company of the United States of America. This is why we have a president and not a king or queen. Only kings or queens can rule countries. Legally, a president cannot rule over a country but can make decisions on behalf of the king or queen. In the case of the United States, that is exactly what our president does. Um, second of all, we need to know and understand that he's not the president of America, so to speak. I think he's just the president of the corporation. You understand what I'm saying? So this whole president of the United States of America, no such thing. He's the president of a corporation. And in any corporation, AT&T, IBM, McDonald's, whatever. Countries don't have presidents. Corporations do. Whenever the president is being introduced, he or she may be referred to as the President of the United States. The United States of America is no different than General Motors of Detroit or Sears and Roebuck of Chicago. These descriptions are referring to companies which reside in a specific jurisdictional area. In Volume 20, Corpus Juris Secundum, 1785, it states, the United States government is a foreign corporation with respect to a state. Each of the 50 states is foreign to the other. This is why you can gamble in Las Vegas, Nevada, but not in Utah. This is also the reason why persons who commit crimes in one state and flee to another are extradited back to the state where the crime was committed. This is done because under law, the state where the crime was committed is the only state that has jurisdictional authority. Under business law, Every corporation must have a president, a secretary of treasury, and so on. Our president is the president of the United States of America. He is not the president of America. This concept can be somewhat confusing, especially since America and the United States is constantly being sold to the public as existing in the same jurisdictional area on the map. The only connection the 50 states have to the United States Corporation is again either by contract and or franchise agreement. A part of this franchise agreement is designated by the status of individuals who call themselves citizens. This contract between the United States of America and the 50 separate states is called an adhesion citizens contract. This adhesion citizens contract is known as the 14th Amendment, which was ratified on July 28, 1868. The second part of the franchise definition mentions that it allows an individual or group to carry out specific commercial activities. These activities fall into a category called interstate commerce. 
Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3 of the United States Constitution is known as the Commerce Clause. It states that Congress has the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the states and with the Indian tribes of the time. This power fell under a regulatory body called the Interstate Commerce Commission or ICC in 1887. Each time you sign your name or pledge an oath, you are changing your status. You may be asking, what about American citizenship? In law, when you see the words American citizen, this denotes that you are a United States citizen contracted into with the birth certificate, social security number, or through your state franchise agreement, which is the adhesion contract of the 14th Amendment. It is critical that you understand that you are not and cannot be an American. An American is a free person who has not made a contractual agreement with the United States Corporation. Remember, you are not an American. You are legally a citizen living in a foreign state. This authorization granted by the corporation called the United States of America can be tied into three main areas of contract, three of which we have mentioned. We looked at the 14th Amendment and we realized that this amendment was really a contract. It was an adhesion contract between the United States government and the citizenry of this country. What that meant for African Americans was this. It meant that the old days of slave ownership where a white male owns a slave on a plantation was done away with. And what the owners who owned those slaves did was transfer their property, which were the slaves, from the slave owner to the United States government under the 14th Amendment. And if you recall when you study history, you'll know that many of the southern states and those slave owners were compensated for transferring their property over to the United States government. So what that means for black folks is this, is that you are not free you are what is called emancipated and an emancipation is not freedom emancipation is the transfer of property from one owner to another owner this process has nothing to do with sovereignty a citizen of the united states corporation or american cannot be sovereign because they do not own the land or have clear title to land further these persons have not established a military to take the land or to create their own land within the continental United States. Two years ago, by my research, I'm convinced it's much more serious than that. It's more than a loose-knit network. It is a conspiracy. In 1784, a copy of this document was sent to the Illuminous Weisop and delegated to foment the French Revolution. I mean the Illuminati was responsible for the French Revolution? Yes, absolutely. The courier was struck dead by lightning as he rode through Radisson, Radisson on his way from Frankfurt to Paris. What about a little divine intervention there, huh? The police found the subversive documents on his body and turned them over to the proper government authorities. After careful study of the plot, the Bavarian government ordered the police to raid Weisop's newly organized lodges of the Grand Orient and the homes of some of the most influential associates, including the castle of Baron Bassen Sonderdorf. Additional evidence was thus obtained convinced the authorities the documents were a genuine copy of a conspiracy by which the synagogue of Satan had controlled the Illuminati at the top, planned to use wars and revolutions to bring about the establishment of one kind or another of a one world government, the powers of which they intended to usurp as soon as it was established. In 1785, the Bavarian government outlawed the, the Illuminati and closed the lodges of the Grand Orient. In 1786, they published the details of the conspiracy. Start up here. In 1784, an act of God placed the Bavarian government in possession of evidence which proved the existence of the continuing Luciferian conspiracy. This explains the previous nine pages, goes into it in detail. We don't have time to do it completely. 
conspiracy. Uh, Adam Weishoff, a Jesuit plain professor of canon law, defected from Christianity and embraced the Luciferian ideology while teaching at Ingolstadt University. In 1770, the money uh, lenders who had recently organized the House of Rothschild retained him to revise and modernize the old, age-old protocols designed to give the synagogue of Satan ultimate world domination so they can impose the Luciferian ide ideology upon the re what remains of the human race after the final social catechism by use of sat satanic despotism. Weinsoff completed his task on May the 1st, 1776. It's a communist holiday, isn't it? May 1, 1776. The plan required the destruction of all existing governments and religions. In 1776, Weishoff organized the Illuminati to put the plot into execution. The word Illuminati is derived from Lucifer and means holders of the light. Weishoff's revised plan required his Illuminati to do the following things to help them accomplish their purpose. One, Use monetary and sex bribery to obtain control of people already occupying positions in high places in the various levels of all governments and other fields of human endeavor. Once an influential person had fallen for the lies, deceits, and temptations of the Illuminati, they were to be held in bondage by application of political and other forms of blackmail and threats of financial ruin, public exposure, and physical harm, and even death to themselves and their loved ones. Number 12 told those present that they must use their wealth to have candidates chosen to public office who would be obedient to their demands and would be used as pawns in the game by the men behind the scenes. The advisors will have been bred, reared, and trained from childhood to rule the affairs of the world. Number 13, control the press. Number 16, infiltrate into the secret Freemasonry to be used for their purposes. That's been documented many times. Number 17, expound the value of systematic deception. Use high sounding slogans and phrases and advocate lavish promises to the masses, even though they cannot be kept. I will not forget the wound to our country and those who inflicted it. I will not yield. I will not rest. I will not relent in waging this struggle for freedom and security for the American people. So I, I don't know where he is, nor do I, you know, I just don't spend that much time on him. We will not tire, we will not falter, and we will not fail. Uh, terror is bigger than one person. And I remember he was telling me how, <laughs> how you're going to see soldiers looking in caves for people in, in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and all these places and it's and there's going to be this war on terror of which there's no real enemy who knows if he's hiding in some cave or not uh, we hadn't heard from him in a long time Operation Northwoods, the plan called for innocent people to be shot on American streets this is the Pentagon for boats carrying refugees fleeing Cuba to be sunk on the high seas, for a wave of violent terrorism to be launched in Washington DC, Miami and elsewhere, people would be framed for bombings they did not commit, planes would be hijacked using phony evidence, all of which would be blamed on Castro to justify an invasion of Cuba 40 years ago. An aircraft at Elgin um, Air Force Base would be painted and numbered as an exact duplicate for a civil registered aircraft belonging to a CIA propriety organization in the Miami area. At a designate time, the duplicate would be substituted for the actual civil aircraft and would be loaded with selected passengers all boarded under carefully prepared aliases. The actual registered aircraft would be converted into a drone, remote controlled plane, their word for it, takeoff times of the drone aircraft and the actual aircraft would be scheduled to allow a rendezvous south of Florida. I mean, he's been tested unlike any other president this 9-11. We have in this past year made great progress in ending the long era of conflict and Cold War.
we have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be. Given what most Americans believe, the next statement may be more shocking than any previous. The fact is, the United States is not a country, but a corporation contractually created by the Constitution. Your state is a country, per the law, and your original citizenship is of that country. Our founders instituted themselves to be first and foremost citizens of their respective states, as of 1787, those states already had formed a union, and they created the Constitution for the purpose of perfecting that union in forming a national government. They did not intend that the new nation have any jurisdiction or powers over the states or their citizens that were not specifically enumerated in the Constitution. They stated this point quite clearly in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the Constitution. They granted the United States exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square as may become the seat of the government of the United States, our District of Columbia, and to exercise authority over all places purchased by the consent of the states. And that is all. The framers further secured the rights of the people with the Ninth and Tenth Amendments in the Bill of Rights. In the Ninth, they established that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And in the Tenth, they made clear that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. The only way the federal government can have any jurisdiction beyond these constitutional clauses is by written permission or contract. Which leads us to another piece of the puzzle, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, ratified in 1868 following the Civil War. As barbaric as it may sound today, the black slaves prior to the conclusion of the Civil War were legally considered to be property with none of the rights or privileges of free-born people, only duties. The money interests took advantage of America's desire to free the slaves and found a way to use the swiftly adopted post-war constitutional amendments to enslave all of the people. The deceit is in the wording of both the 13th and 14th Amendments. You will note that the 13th Amendment provides that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. But why the emphasis on involuntary servitude? Isn't it the same thing as slavery? Sure it is. But they had to mention the concept of involuntary servitude because they wished to retain another type of slavery, voluntary servitude. Voluntary servitude is an ancient and established concept. It was the way serfs became subjects to their lords during feudal times in England and other European countries. It was a way for free men to earn a living at a time when all property was held by a select few and thus anyone who wanted to farm and support their family had first to agree to be subject to a lord of the land. Our forefathers hated this concept and designed our Constitution to exclude titles of nobility, making all Americans sovereign. The 14th Amendment turned the intention of the founders on its ear by making voluntary servitude a requirement for former slaves to gain the rights already guaranteed to freeborn United States citizens. When the slaves were released from their involuntary servitude following the war, their status was changed from that of being property to that of being a person. But being a person still entitled them to none of the rights associated with citizenship. So the 14th Amendment ostensibly was written 
to provide the former slaves with the same constitutional rights of freeborn American citizens, but only if they agreed first to become subject to the jurisdiction of the corporate United States, making oneself paramountly, that is, first subject to the jurisdiction of the laws of the United States, however, limits access to parts of the Bill of Rights, as we'll explain in a moment. But first remember, anyone who voluntarily subjects himself to the laws or jurisdiction of another is, in every way, obligated to abide by the terms of any contracts or laws established by whomever establishes the rules of the contract. In simple terms, this meant that the former slaves became subjects first to the United States and secondly to the state in which they lived. They had no sovereignty whatsoever. This status had never existed in the United States prior to that time. The 14th Amendment created a new class of citizenship in the United States, a second-class citizenship. Up until 1868, every American was a paramount citizen of their state, and by virtue of that, also a citizen of the United States, with full individual sovereignty as guaranteed by Amendments 9 and 10 in the Bill of Rights. But so-called naturalized citizens, or 14th Amendment citizens, are paramountly subject to all laws of the United States, and, having no status as freeborn citizens, have no access at all to the unenumerated rights retained for the people by Articles 9 and 10 of the Bill of Rights. That's because, in order to get any rights at all, they had to subject themselves to the jurisdiction of the corporate United States which left them no unenumerated rights. The only rights they had were those specifically written into the Constitution. The sad tragedy of America today is that all U.S. citizens, regardless of race, are now 14th Amendment slaves due to contracts with the government of the United States through Social Security, birth certificates, driving licenses, citizenship statements, tax forms, and many other documents. The true paramount citizenship that all Americans deserve is that of their respective state, which is a sovereign citizenship. Such status would exempt them from federal and state income taxes, as well as property and inheritance taxes. This sovereign citizenship was the status held by our forefathers. Now, if you're still thinking that the U.S. government needs to have a central bank and collect income tax or it will collapse, think again. Over two-thirds of the federal government's income is derived from sources other than income tax. There is even evidence suggesting that none of your income tax is used by the government. Fees, excise taxes, tariffs, sales taxes, and other forms of income have easily supported the U.S. budget in the past and could easily support it now. We have done without a national bank for large stretches of our history, and the U.S. Treasury is perfectly capable of printing and managing a money supply. In fact, the only constitutionally sanctioned currency is backed by gold or other precious metals. This is a far more stable form of currency and is the type of money the Treasury was designed to handle. The government was doing so well collecting money under these original laws that it had amassed a huge surplus by the time this cartoon was penned a hundred years later in 1887, when there still was no income tax collected at all. Up to this point, we have shown you how the money interests have, one, established the Federal Reserve System, and two, exploited a second class of citizenship created by the 14th Amendment for other purposes. And we have mentioned a few names involved in the creation of the Fed. But there are other organizations working for our economic enslavement as well along with other extremely rich and powerful international bankers those who support the fed have created a global movement to centralize economic power in various puppet organizations that preach peace and stability through some variation of socialism but act aggressively to draw nations into a web of foreign debt and servitude to their agenda the united nations the world monetary fund and the council on foreign relations are all committed to an agenda of world domination through manipulation of economic power. The Council on Foreign Relations openly admits to being a private club, 
yet it is the primary recruiting post in both international banking and the federal government of the United States. Richard Nixon, Nelson Rockefeller, John Foster Dulles, Dean Rusk, Alger Hiss, Robert S. McNamara, and every president since FDR, with the exception of John Kennedy, have been members of this exclusive club where super financiers and your elected representatives can mix freely and plan the next step in the consolidation of power in a new world order. The affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. A new world order. Uh, a new world order. Uh, a new world order. A number of years ago, the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve, produced a document entitled Modern Money Mechanics. This publication detailed the institutionalized practice of money creation as utilized by the Federal Reserve and the web of global commercial banks it supports. On the opening page, the document states its objective. The purpose of this booklet is to describe the basic process of money creation in a fractional reserve banking system. It then proceeds to describe this fractional reserve process through various banking terminology. A translation of which goes something like this. The United States government decides it needs some money, so it calls up the Federal Reserve and requests, say, $10 billion. The Fed replies, saying, sure, we'll buy $10 billion in government bonds from you. So the government takes some pieces of paper, paints some official looking designs on them, and calls them treasury bonds. Then it puts a value on these bonds to the sum of $10 billion and sends them over to the Fed. In turn, the people at the Fed draw up a bunch of impressive pieces of paper themselves, only this time calling them Federal Reserve Notes, also designating a value of $10 billion to the set. The Fed then takes these notes and trades them for the bonds. Once this exchange is complete, the government then takes the $10 billion in Federal Reserve Notes and deposits it into a bank account. And upon this deposit, the paper notes officially become legal tender money, adding $10 billion to the U.S. money supply. And there it is. $10 billion in new money has been created. Of course, this example is a generalization, for, in reality, this transaction would occur electronically, with no paper used at all. In fact, only 3% of the U.S. money supply exists in physical currency. The other 97% essentially exists in computers alone. Now, government bonds are, by design, instruments of debt. And when the Fed purchases these bonds, with money it essentially created out of thin air, the government is actually promising to pay back that money to the Fed. In other words, the money was created out of debt. This mind-numbing paradox of how money or value can be created out of debt or a liability will become more clear as we further this exercise. So the exchange has been made and now $10 billion sits in a commercial bank account. Here is where it gets really interesting. For as based on the fractional reserve practice, that $10 billion deposit instantly becomes part of the bank's reserves, just as all deposits do. And regarding reserve requirements, as stated in Modern Money Mechanics, a bank must maintain legally required reserves equal to a prescribed percentage of its deposits. It then quantifies this by stating, under current regulations, the reserve requirement against most transaction accounts is 10%. This means that with a $10 billion deposit, 10% or 1 billion is held as the required reserve while the other nine billion is considered an excessive reserve and can be used as the basis for new loans. Now, it is logical to assume that this nine billion is literally coming out of the existing ten billion dollar deposit. However, this is actually not the case. What really happens is that the nine billion is simply created out of thin air on top of the existing ten billion dollar deposit. This is how the money supply is expanded. As stated in Modern Money Mechanics, of course they, the banks, do not really pay out loans from the money they receive as deposits. If they did this, no additional money would be created. What they do when they make loans is to accept promissory notes, loan contracts, in exchange for credits, money, 
to the borrower's transaction accounts. In other words, the nine billion can be created out of nothing simply because there is a demand for such a loan and that there is a ten billion dollar deposit to satisfy the reserve requirements. Now, let's assume that somebody walks into this bank and borrows the newly available nine billion dollars. They will then most likely take that money and deposit it into their own bank account. The process then repeats, for that deposit becomes part of the bank's reserves. 10% is isolated and in turn 90% of the 9 billion or 8.1 billion is now available as newly created money for more loans. And of course that 8.1 can be loaned out and redeposited creating an additional 7.2 billion to 6.5 billion to 5.9 billion etc. This deposit money creation loan cycle can technically go on to infinity. The average mathematical result is that about 90 billion dollars can be created on top of the original 10 billion. In other words, for every deposit that ever occurs in the banking system, about nine times that amount can be created out of thin air. Money jitters, ask the obliging Bank of America for a jar of soothing instant money, M-O-N-E-Y, in the form of a convenient personal loan. So, now that we understand how money is created by this fractional reserve banking system, a logical yet elusive question might come to mind. What is actually giving this newly created money value? The answer? The money that already exists. The new money essentially steals value from the existing money supply. For the total pool of money is being increased irrespective to demand for goods and services. And as supply and demand finds equilibrium, prices rise, diminishing the purchasing power of each individual dollar. This is generally referred to as inflation, and inflation is essentially a hidden tax on the public. What is the advice that you generally get? And that is, inflate the currency. They don't say debase the currency. They don't say devalue the currency. They don't say cheat the people who are saved. They say lower the interest rates. The real deception is when we distort the value of money. When we create money out of thin air, we have no savings, and yet there's so-called capital. So my question boils down to this. How in the world can we expect to solve the problems of inflation, that is, the increase in the supply of money, with more inflation? Of course, it can't. The fractional reserve system of monetary expansion is inherently inflationary. For the act of expanding the money supply without there being a proportional expansion of goods and services in the economy will always debase a currency. In fact, a quick glance at the historical values of the US dollar versus the money supply reflects this point definitively, for the inverse relationship is obvious. One dollar in 1913 required $21.60 in 2007 to match value. That is a 96% devaluation since the Federal Reserve came into existence. Now, if this reality of inherent and perpetual inflation seems absurd and economically self-defeating, hold that thought, for absurdity is an understatement in regard to how our financial system really operates. For in our financial system, money is debt and debt is money. Here is a chart of the US money supply from 1950 to 2006. Here is a chart of the US national debt for the same period. How interesting it is that the trends are virtually the same. For the more money there is, the more debt there is. The more debt there is, the more money there is. To put it a different way, every single dollar in your wallet is owed to somebody by somebody. For remember, the only way the money can come into existence is from loans. Therefore, if everyone in the country were able to pay off all debts, including the government, there would not be one dollar in circulation. In fact, the last time in American history the national debt was completely paid off was in 1835 after President Andrew Jackson shut down the central bank that preceded the Federal Reserve. 
In fact, Jackson's entire political platform essentially revolved around his commitment to shut down the central bank, stating at one point, the bold efforts the present bank has made to control the government are but premonitions of the fate that awaits the American people should they be deluded into a perpetuation of this institution or the establishment of another like it. Unfortunately, his message was short-lived and the international bankers succeeded to install another central bank in 1913, the Federal Reserve. And as long as this institution exists, perpetual debt is guaranteed. Now, so far we have discussed the reality that money is created out of debt, through loans. These loans are based on a bank's reserves and reserves are derived from deposits. And through this fractional reserve system, any one deposit can create nine times its original value, in turn debasing the existing money supply, raising prices in society. And since all this money is created out of debt and circulated randomly through commerce, people become detached from their original debt and a disequilibrium exists where people are forced to compete for labor in order to pull enough money out of the money supply to cover their costs of living. As dysfunctional and backwards as all of this might seem, there is still one thing we have omitted from this equation. And it is this element of the structure which reveals the truly fraudulent nature of the system itself the application of interest. When the government borrows money from the Fed, or when a person borrows money from a bank, it almost always has to be paid back with accrued interest. In other words, almost every single dollar that exists must be eventually returned to a bank with interest paid as well. But if all money is borrowed from the central bank and is expanded by commercial banks through loans, only what would be referred to as the principal is being created in the money supply. So then, where is the money to cover all of the interest that is charged? Nowhere. It doesn't exist. The ramifications of this are staggering, for the amount of money owed back to the banks will always exceed the amount of money that is available in circulation. This is why inflation is a constant in the economy for new money is always needed to help cover the perpetual deficit built into the system, caused by the need to pay the interest. What this also means is that mathematically, defaults and bankruptcy are literally built into the system and there will always be poor pockets of society that get the short end of the stick. An analogy would be a game of musical chairs, for once the music stops, somebody is left out to dry. And that's the point. It invariably transfers true wealth from the individual to the banks. For if you are unable to pay for your mortgage, they will take your property. This is particularly enraging when you realize that not only is such a default inevitable due to the fractional reserve practice, but also because of the fact that the money that the bank loaned to you didn't even legally exist in the first place. In 1969, there was a Minnesota court case involving a man named Jerome Daly, who was challenging the foreclosure of his home by the bank, which provided the loan to purchase it. His argument was that the mortgage contract required both parties, being he and the bank, each put up a legitimate form of property for the exchange. In legal language, this is called consideration. Mr. Daly explained that the money was, in fact, not the property of the bank, for it was created out of nothing as soon as the loan agreement was signed. Remember what modern money mechanics stated about loans? What they do when they make loans is to accept promissory notes in exchange for credits. Reserves are unchanged by the loan transactions, but deposit credits constitute new additions to the total deposits of the banking system. In other words, the money doesn't come out of their existing assets. The bank is simply inventing it, putting up nothing of its own, except for a theoretical liability on paper. As the court case progressed, the bank's president, Mr. Morgan, took the stand, and in the judge's personal memorandum, he recalled that, 
The plaintiff, Banks President, admitted that, in combination with the Federal Reserve Bank, did create the money and credit upon its books by bookkeeping entry. The money and credit first came into existence when they created it. Mr. Morgan admitted that no United States law or statute existed which gave him the right to do this. A lawful consideration must exist and be tendered to support the note. The jury found that there was no lawful consideration and I agree. He also poetically added, only God can create something of value out of nothing. And upon this revelation, the court rejected the bank's claim for foreclosure and daily kept his home. The implications of this court decision are immense. For every time you borrow money from a bank, whether it is a mortgage loan or a credit card charge, the money given to you is not only counterfeit, it is an illegitimate form of consideration and hence voids the contract to repay, for the bank never had the money as property to begin with. Unfortunately, such legal realizations are suppressed and ignored, and the game of perpetual wealth transfer and perpetual debt continues. And this brings us to the ultimate question. Why? During the American Civil War, President Lincoln bypassed the high interest loans offered by the European banks and decided to do what the Founding Fathers advocated, which was to create an independent and inherently debt-free currency. It was called the Greenback. Shortly after this measure was taken, an internal document circulated between private British and American banking interests stated, Slavery is but the owning of labor and carries with it the care of laborers, while the European plan is that capital shall control labor by controlling wages. This can be done by controlling the money. It will not do to allow the greenback, as we cannot control that. The fractional reserve policy perpetrated by the Federal Reserve, which has spread in practice to the great majority of banks in the world, is, in fact, a system of modern slavery. Think about it. Money is created out of debt. And what do people do when they are in debt? They submit to employment to pay it off. But if money can only be created out of loans, how can society ever be debt free? It can't. And that's the point. And it is the fear of losing assets coupled with the struggle to keep up with the perpetual debt and inflation inherent in the system, compounded by the inescapable scarcity within the money supply itself, created by the interest that can never be repaid, that keeps the wage slave in line. Running on the hamster wheel with millions of others, in effect powering an empire that truly benefits only the elite at the top of the pyramid. For, at the end of the day, who are you really working for? The banks. Money is created in a bank and invariably ends up in a bank. They are the true masters, along with the corporations and governments they support. Physical slavery requires people to be housed and fed. Economic slavery requires people to feed and house themselves. It is one of the most ingenious scams for social manipulation ever created and at its core it is an invisible war against the population. Debt is the weapon used to conquer and enslave societies and interest is its prime ammunition. And as the majority walks around oblivious to this reality the banks in collusion with governments and corporations, continue to perfect and expand their tactics of economic warfare, spawning new bases, such as the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. A common misconception among people is that any rule or regulation that governs them falls under one category, law. But there are many other forms of law that people abide by without realizing that they simply do not apply to them. Another misconception is that a nation's constitution gives us our rights. A constitution does nothing more than list the rights that we already have. We are born with inalienable rights, endowed to us by our Creator. They are not given to us and they cannot be given away. The most a person can do with a right is choose whether to exercise it or not. Maritime Admiralty Law is what's known as the Law of the Water. 
It is superseded by civil law and only applies to those who willingly contract themselves into it. The definition of admiralty law is a body of private international law governing the relationships between private entities which operate vessels on the oceans. Let's look at how and why a form of law that is fashioned to govern corporations, businesses and vessels has imposed its rule over natural human beings. This is all done through a form of word magic. A simple perversion of language has made it possible to convince people around the world that these alternative laws apply to them. One of the predominant beliefs in modern culture is that licenses, permits, registrations and other forms of documentation are required to operate motor vehicles, use public roads, build structures and establishments, engage in free enterprise and much more. Sadly, these beliefs are based on little to no investigation whatsoever and are false. This belief structure is perpetuated by maritime admiralty law. This form of law was originally created to govern ships docking in foreign nations for the import or export of products and resources. It deals with banking and merchant affairs, not civil affairs. When a product is taken off of a ship and brought into a foreign land, that nation takes custody of the resource and accounts for it with a certificate. That certificate marks the birth date of that product in the custody of the respective nation. Think of why it is supposedly required to have a certificate of live birth in the first place. The Barron's Dictionary of Banking Terms defines a certificate as a paper establishing an ownership claim. So right there, we notice that everyone with a birth certificate is defined as being owned. People are used as collateral with other nations because the U.S. is bankrupt. The United States declared bankruptcy on March 9th of 1933. At this point, the U.S. began taking out loans from a private, non-government affiliated corporation called the Federal Reserve. With no money to pay back the loans, the United States began using the citizens as collateral. All birth and marriage certificates are literally warehouse receipts. Just look at the similarities of warehouse receipts and birth certificates. Both document the date of issue, a serial number, registration number or receipt number, a description of the product, and an authorized informant to notify the appropriate government agency. With all of this information being readily available, the majority of people are unaware of their involvement with maritime admiralty law. This is possible through the manipulation of language. This admiralty law changed the meaning of the word person from a natural living person to a corporation. Driver's licenses, vehicle registrations, auto insurance forms, building permits, gun permits, work permits, tax filing documents, birth and death certificates, traffic citations, and many other forms of documentation that were once believed to be absolutely necessary only apply to persons or corporations. Upon signing such a legal document, you are indirectly waiving your rights under the Constitution and lowering your status to that of a corporation that is created with the same exact name as you. The only way to reconcile your true name from the name of the corporation is to take notice that the corporation has its name in all capital letters. This is known as Capitus Diminutia Maxima. There are two kinds of law on the earth, as I've said. One is called civil law, which is the law of the land. And one is called maritime admiralty, which is called the law of water. Uh, the maritime admiralty is banking law. And the law on the maritime admiralty says that you, because you came out of your mother's water, are a maritime admiralty product. This is why the ship is sitting in its berth and it's tied to the dock and the captain has to give a certificate of manifest to the port authorities because money is changing hands. This is why when you were born you have to have a birth certificate. You are a maritime admiralty product. 
and therefore your birth certificate is signed by your mother and where your mother signed on the birth certificate get it you will see it does not say parent or mother it says informant your mother was informing the, the, the bank that she has just produced another product to be bought and sold. England, the British Crown through international banking owns your physical body and that's the law. And if you could get your original birth certificate back you would find that on the back of the birth certificate are all the banks around the world. All over the world banks have used your birth certificate because you are a stock in a maritime admiralty banking scheme where you make money for banks. Consequently, the corporation and government and people who want to control you, they create a second you, and that second you that they control, that they created, is all capital letters. Check it out. Anytime you get a bill, get a lawsuit, you get a fine, a ticket. Somebody sent you a bill from the Department of Water Power. Check it out on your driver's license, on your social security card, on your insurance card, anything, period. Anything having to do with business, your name will always be all capital letters because only all capital letters can be dealt with by banks and government. Anytime you have a name upper or lower case, that, that applies to you. I've got no control of you. You sign a contract in which your name is in all capital letters, now I can take it to court. The national debt measures the wealth. The wealth, the wealth, the wealth here we are. The larger the national debt, the it's an indication of the wealth of the country. You're right. So the more you owe, the more you're worth. Um, I'll say it slowly, okay? Uh, that here. Um, no, look, Jan, come on, get, Jan, get, get real, Jan, get real. I can't explain. If you shut up. And I think I think this interview is coming to an end. Someday, when you shut up and you want to talk about something, let's talk about this. Thank you. Stop. We're done. Let's talk Get about out of here. Let's just no. let's, let's just change the subject. I, I, we don't have to talk about something. Yeah, listen, you get the fuck out of here. I'll show you the window. Out.